Hi guys, it's Ben from Heirloom Pianos. So, fantastic news. Uh, we have just come to the end of our Richard Lip restoration project. So, I just thought I would do a little video describing the nature of the work, what we've done, and just uh, presenting a, an interesting experiment into restoration of a, a very unusual instrument. So, we'll talk about the eccentricities of the design as well as a little bit of the history. So this piano has been fully restored and just to give you some provenance the serial number of the piano dates it to 1885. As you can see it's a little bit behind on its uh, tuning making schedule there as well. It's an interesting instrument in that at this point we have to kind of go back to the 19th century and determine a little bit about how the piano was made, where it was made, and the instruments that were produced at the time. So at this point in time, 1885, this is four years after Steinway in New York had stopped producing uh, square pianos. Um, there was still a very large fashion for the Victorian cottage pianos. Um, most of what was being produced were very high-end instruments for the wealthy elite. And this in itself was, in its day, a very, very expensive piano, but was one of the progenies of the movement towards uprights that became um, a real status symbol for the middle class, especially in places like the United Kingdom. Um, Richard Lipp were a Stuttgart manufacturer, and they have, well, they still exist today in one form or another, but the main factory uh, disappeared around World War II, um, and as a result, uh, you know, there's not a, a huge amount that uh, I can sort of determine and glean in regards to history. Um, the lips are an interesting model in that they were mostly sold and marketed in Europe, the United Kingdom, and Australasia, so they're a very common piano to see in Australia and New Zealand. And this is an interesting model in that it has an extremely overstrung design. So having a look at the bass strings, you'll see that the actual angle of the strings is very, very steep. And the advantage of that is that you have a much longer string length. Uh, the disadvantage for the poor piano tuner is that the last few pins are obscured. So in the factory, they strung the back and then installed these sides afterwards. So the poor piano tuner that has to get to the last few pins will need a special tool. And fortunately, I have one here which I've handmade myself and it's a very, very small tuning hammer that basically fits onto the last here. Now someone very naughtily many, many years ago has attempted to carve out a whole lot of the side of the piano just to get access to the uh, pins. That obviously was well before my time. But um, anyway, so with this sort of piano, it's an unusual design. These were very, very high quality instruments in their day, and they were designed uh, with a very high caliber of uh, materials. The focus was on producing a very high-end instrument and just showing you the back here in terms of the back posts and struts which we'll talk about a little bit later um, everything is indicative of an extremely well-built handmade instrument um, restoration of this sort of product is interesting and when you first approach this sort of uh, repair work you end up with a dilemma in that you have to think about whether the piano is to be restored or conserved and the two of them are very different so conservation tends to be more preserving it as an original instrument as close to how it left the factory and restoration tends to be much more along the lines of uh, updating uh, changing looking at old designs and essentially making them new or redesigning them to work better and more practically um, so in this case, it was a hard act, but hand was partially forced from the fact that this had had a restoration done on it at some point. So looking at the scaling of the bass strings initially, I suspect that 
it had a lot of restoration work done to it in say the 1950s and 1960s so some aspects were slightly uh, difficult to conserve in that the original was was long gone and so there's probably a lot more in the way of refurbishing and restoring to a new uh, newer style of instrument and part of that's also been the fact that this is to be owned by a, a pianist who is a very well-established player so he needs something that's going to hold tune something that's going to be reliable and uh, provide a very high-end service of uh, or quality of uh, playing so I'll do a quick demonstration now and then after that I'll run you through the work that we've done so I uh, feel free to sit back and enjoy and uh, appreciate the music Alright, so we've done a partial disassembly of the piano and the purpose of this is just to demonstrate the uh, work that we've done on the instrument. Um, I'll start pretty much in a chronological order of what we've done. So first and foremost, when this piano came to the workshop, we had to do some restoration work to the soundboard of the piano. And on assessment, the issue that we ran into, and it's particularly a problem with this type of extended lip piano, is that if you have a quick look here, you'll actually see that the cast iron plate of the piano is built into the piano. So when this was new in the factory, it would have been strung as a strung back, and then they would have added both sides of the piano, thus making it impossible to remove the cast iron plate without actually pulling off the sides which in terms of disassembly is a step um, beyond what I kind of normally undertake with restoration work. So what we've gone for instead of a traditional uh, repair with shims is an epoxy consolidation on the soundboard. So if we have a quick look here you'll see that there's a soundboard and you'll see that there are some cracks and compression ridges but what we've done is when the piano's on its back, we have basically stressed the uh, timber of the soundboard by heating it. And what this does is lowers the uh, moisture content of the uh, timber. And once it is reduced to a point below what it's normally going to undertake, we either fill the holes with an epoxy filler or seal them off with an actual liquid epoxy. So the theory is once it sets and once the instrument uh, returns to a standard sort of equilibrium moisture content of the uh, soundboard, uh, you have additional crown that wasn't there previously. So as you can see, um, this has all been restrung and we've put new listening belt in there, uh, new 
tuning pins. This has all been shined up, which is nice. Um, in terms of other issues, there was a crack in the pin block here, but what we've done is sealed that. So again, that was an epoxy consolidation, which is essentially a conservation treatment. When the pins were completely removed, we uh, basically sealed these by filling basically the dozen pins here and dozen pins here with an epoxy. Um, that was a West System 206 slow fill resin. So that set and essentially filled that hole. And once that had set, these were re-drilled and then from there um, basically repinned. So the dozen or so pins here feel quite tight compared to the others, but the reality is that's just the fit from the epoxy and uh, the fit from the epoxy and the fact that it's uh, slightly tighter than the rest, but that should certainly be sealed for life. I'm not particularly concerned about that. Um, in terms of what we've done with the uh, restoration here, the piano has been rescaled. So traditionally speaking, uh, this is unusual in that it has a number of unwound by cords. Now we've decided to keep most of these and then just play with the, uh, essentially the core diameter and the winding diameters of the base. Um, in the original piano, there were a couple of unwound by cords here, which we've decided to take out just because in terms of the break and consistency of moving from one section to another, um, it wasn't really working when we input the uh, break strain and the inharmonicity into the scale itself. Um, other things we have done. So this is a brand new set of Vargis key tops. So the original were an older style celluloid. Unlikely, it was likely that they probably weren't the originals that were on here previous. This piano has undertaken an early restoration. Uh, if we have a quick look down here, you'll see that we've replaced all of the key bushings. These were particularly difficult just because the mortise sizes are below 10 millimeters, which is fairly standard for modern instruments, which made it a little bit difficult to fill them. Uh, the back uh, felt for the capstans was also replaced as well, as well as all the assembly here. And I'll just take you back down to the bottom of the piano. So the pedals have been repolished. You can see there's the sealed soundboard and all its glory and the remainder of the strings on the bridge. Um, unusually in this piano, the bass bridge is to the extreme right of the soundboard. Um, in terms of why they've done that, the main reason is that you can have exceptionally long strings. So having done the string calculations on here, bottom A of this piano is a fraction longer than on a new Yamaha C5, which is their two meter grand piano. So in terms of scaling, you have a very substantial sound. Um, there are some disadvantages, we'll, which we'll get to in a second. In terms of the caliber of the instrument and the exterior, so the piano has been refinished. I'll put it all back together to show you in a second. But the other thing we've done is this would have been originally had a backing at the back of the piano. And we have all this we've made ourselves and put a little anything on here. The reason I'm showing you this is that this model of piano has an unusual uh, back assembly in terms of braces for the soundboard. So it's not dissimilar from what you find with UX series Yamahas, obviously much, much earlier, but in terms of the way that it was designed and built, they really did a lot of research and were very particular about making sure that the soundboard stays in a certain uh, curvature and also that the structure was stable. And now just moving over to the action mechanism here. So what we've done with this, it's essentially a complete replacement of most of the components. And um, I'm just gonna do a slight backtrack and grab a few of the older samples to show you. But the first thing that we did was replace the dampers on this piano. So this is a brand new Takiwa damper assembly, and there's a few unusual things happening in the base here, but I'll explain that in a second. Um, here is, I'll just show you a picture of what we had originally. So this was the original damper mechanism that was on the piano. 
And most unusually with this, if we have a look at how this works here, you'll see that there is a return spring located behind the action lever. So if we just have a look here, you'll see that basically what happens is when the lever returns back, uh, the spring just down the bottom here releases it and makes it push back against the strings. Um, and you'll see that it's actually attached to the top of the action rail. Interestingly enough, with this model, looking at this, um, these were traditionally attached to the side of the action rail. And um, the reason they were replaced, there's two reasons, one of which is that the felt was glued to this here. And in terms of adjustment, there was very little adjustment that could be made to the felt position, just because this was a solid piece of timber. Whereas most modern assemblies, as you can see, have uh, little wires that can be bent and adjusted. And um, as I said, this is like a full Takiwa assembly with new damper felts. Um, the other reason was that these little compression springs on here were beginning to fail. So they're screwed to the side and basically the impetus of this little spring makes the lever return and Potentially these could have been replaced, however the issue that we had was that the mechanism and especially this flange in particular were beginning to disintegrate. So attempting to replace a few of these, I broke three or four of the flanges and that's usually a good sign that you have to replace the components as opposed to restoring. Um, I also have a copy of the original hammers. So this is... The original hammer as you can see the repetition spring is looking a little bit sorry so this has been replaced with a brand new set of uh, Tokiwa butts uh, these are U1 style so they're actually a Yamaha U1 source component um, the hammers that we've replaced are Arbel Naturals so Arbel Encore is the technical name and in terms of a felt which is designed for use in European instruments, from my experience, they're really sort of the uh, top of the range that can be installed in this style of piano. Uh, you've got walnut mouldings as well. But what I like in particular is the fact that there's not a huge amount of voicing that they require, um, so they're a little bit easier to, to work with. As you can see here, and especially with the original hammer, if we have a quick look, um, there's a lot of what we call shaping that's happened to the hammer. So if we have a quick look here, you'll notice that this is a whole hammer. And as we move down, the hammers decrease in terms of size. And the main reason for that is the fact that with such an extreme angle on the bass strings, um, you get fantastic lengths of string. The compromise is that to facilitate an action mechanism that works, the hammers have to be at an extreme angle compared to a traditional size instrument. So what you'll notice is a lot of material has been removed from these hammers. And the main reason is that otherwise they would literally uh, collide with each other. And that isn't particularly conducive to um, an effective style of playing. Uh, you'll also notice that these are slightly unorthodox damper felts. Um, and the reason for this is that when you have such an extreme scale, the tolerances and spacing between the strings is very limited. So from the research I've done, no aftermarket parts or no sort of parts supplied by major manufacturers will actually fit this style of piano. So what we've done is installed some Arbel uh, bicord felt here, and we've got some Arbel clip here as well that's been thinned off. So um, because these are very small, especially considering the size of string, uh, the springs have been replaced in the damper levers to allow for a little bit more tension and return. So it's uh, more of a heavy duty style assembly. Um, in terms of the action and the work that's been done, full regulation, um, a little bit of voicing, but I tend to leave that till slightly later after the restoration. And the alignment's also been 
down with hammers. So I'll put this back in the mechanism and we'll do a little bit more talking about the work that we've done. And from there we will um, do a little bit of playing.